It had happened so suddenly. Only a moment ago, everything had been fine. Then the submarine had struck something, the crash causing the entire vessel to shake and ripple. Knocked over onto the floor, Vasily expected to see a horrifying wall of water rushing down the corridor towards him, ready to sweep him up and batter his bones against the K-122's innards. But there was no wave, no sudden all-consuming flood, just the dull pain of being thrown to the ground by the colossal shake. The submarine was intact, undamaged, although the crew aboard could hardly say the same. Sobol got to work tending the wounded. There were a few minor concussions, the occasional gash, nothing some antiseptic and gauze couldn't fix. What felt worse was the explosive fury of Captain Tarasokvich, at least to Vasily, who had to experience the worst of it. The submarine had hit a mountain. That was the obstruction that had been the cause of the crash. But it had landed First Officer Vasily Kestrov firmly in the crosshairs of Tarasokvich's anger. He hurled obscenities with bile and fury in his voice, called Vasily incompetent, and accused him of being ungrateful to have his position. It had been his old friend Captain Tarasokvich who secured Vasily the role of first officer. He stood there and accepted the relentless punishment, even as Tarasokvich, a man he admired as a leader, verbally tore into him. Kestrov held his tongue. He knew there was a problem here. Something was not right. He checked the maps thoroughly, could have even sighted their present coordinates off the top of his head just by guessing, and probably be exactly right. And he knew there should have been nothing around them but open water. There was no mountain. But the question was, what had the submarine just hit? Vasily had never bought into all the stories about the submarine. He'd been warned by friends after he accepted the position aboard the K-122 that there had been incidents on board. Even when he met his old friend, Dmitry Teskovich, to accept the role of first officer, the decorated Soviet captain had even made jokes about the sub's reputation as being cursed. Vasily had heard rumors before that several of the workers constructing the K-122 were injured, or a few were maybe killed by a freak accident. The exact details of the story seemed entirely dependent on the person that was telling it. Things were often changed, reordered, embellished. One of Vasily's friends, in a vodka-soaked ramble, had claimed the entire construction team had died while working on the K-122, attributing the supposed deaths to witches, black magic, the Baba Yaga, and all other manner of superstitions. He called it a bad omen that Vasily had been asked by Tereskovich to serve on the crew. The captain himself had a different version. He half-heartedly joked about some sudden accidents that took place how it made some of the workforce grow paranoid. Some heard voices or had hallucinations. Others were sleepless for weeks. Of course, they would be, Tereskovich had joked. What else could they expect from working nights? Vasily had remembered not finding the joke very funny, but still he made sure the captain could hear his laugh. He had no idea just how bad things really were. The Kremlin had gone to great lengths to hide the full details of the K-122's troubled production. None of the crew stationed on the sub had any clue that the accidents that befell the construction workers should have been impossible. And certainly nobody on board was aware that the workforce had mysteriously disappeared once the K-122 was completed, each of them taken in the night after a suspicious knock at the door, those who had still been alive, at least. Adapting to the sudden change that was his new position proved jarring for Vasily Kestrov. He'd been just another soldier in the naval infantry before Captain Tereskovich had pulled the necessary strings to have him transferred to the K-122. Now he was faced with the pressure of not only the responsibility of being first officer, but also the expectations that came from continuing his family's generations-long naval tradition. He was under no illustrations that he'd sign on to a difficult post, but little could have prepared him for what he'd encounter in the cramped confines of the K-122. When the submarine made its initial departure, setting out on its maiden voyage, a champagne bottle was swung towards the K-122 to mark its launch. The bottle did not break, a foreboding omen of what was to come. Despite sharing the tight environment inside the sub with 150 other men, the prospect of being so deep underwater, charting courses through parts of the ocean untouched by human beings was exciting to Vasily. 
or it would have been if he could actually see the vast ocean around him. There were no portholes, just over a hundred crew crammed together. Yet, strangely though, he'd read through the manifests. Vasily kept encountering new members of the crew whose names he did not recognize from the documents. Sometimes it felt like they appeared out of nowhere. He chalked it up to his inexperience as first officer, and assured that over time it'd be easier to keep track of who was aboard the sub. Five days after their departure, on June 5, 1963, Captain Tereskovich received new orders from command, causing the K-122 to change course. They had been crossing the North Atlantic when word came through that the submarine needed to reach a spot off the coast of Nova Scotia, all the way on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Vasily found it strange that they would be deployed there. After all, Canada was hardly considered a threat to the motherland. Vasily wasn't even sure they had nuclear weapons yet. Something about the mission felt off. Wrong. It didn't add up and the lack of sense gnawed at the newly appointed first officer so much that he queried it with Tereskovich. But the sub-captain refused to explain why. The order had come direct from the Kremlin. That was all he'd said. The information was need to know only. Within a day of the new orders from Moscow, one of the men, Melnik, suddenly came down with a strange fever. The sub's onboard medic, Dr. Sobel, did his best to treat the rapidly onset illness. However, nobody could figure out what had happened to Melnik. One day, he'd been fine. The next, he was insisting he could see outside the K-122 into the water, as if he'd somehow managed to hallucinate portholes. Vasily couldn't begin to understand what was wrong with this man, but raised it with Tereskovich anyway. The captain seemed indifferent insisting that Melnik's condition wasn't an issue and to keep him isolated in the medical bay. The next day, the same fever seemed to have spread to more of the crew. Another, Petrov, had also fallen sick, with symptoms that almost match Melnik's, except far more disturbing. He claimed to be hearing voices coming from outside the sub, as if there was someone speaking to him through the ocean, as if that wasn't unsettling enough. Something Petrov said stuck with Vasily four hours after, the crewman claimed that when he had glimpses of the ocean around them, just like Melnik had, he said he had seen bodies in the water. Through his worry, Vasily tried desperately to find a rational explanation. He thought perhaps Petrov had overheard what Melnik said about his hallucinations, and it had made him paranoid. But a voice right at the back of the first officer's mind wondered if maybe his fellow crewmen were right, and that there really was something out there in the uncharted depths of the ocean. Once again, Vasily's pleads with Tereskovich to do something fell on deaf ears. The pressure to carry out the Kremlin's orders were clearly weighing on them, and at one point caused them to crack. The captain, who normally kept a level head, yelled furiously at Dr. Sobel, demanding that he do his job and cure Melnik and Petrov of whatever was making them hallucinate. In the two long decades he'd known the man, Vasily had never heard Tereskovich shout like that at anyone. It was clear that whatever the Kremlin was ordering of K-122, it had been taking a heavy toll on the submarine's senior officer. That night, Vasily started to hear voices too, a whispering sound right in his ear while he slept, although he couldn't decipher what it was saying. Suddenly, a panicked Dr. Sobel arrived at his cabin, telling the first officer about Melnik and Petrov. Vasily tried to rally the rest of the crew to help search for the men now missing from the medbay but Captain Tereskovich kept undermining his orders, as if he didn't care about the missing men. They found Petrov's body in the torpedo bay. Somehow he'd lifted a pistol from one of the officers. It had all gotten too much for him. Melnik was nowhere to be found. There was no possible way he could have jumped overboard from a submarine deep beneath the surface of the ocean, unless he had put himself inside the torpedo tube. The next day, Tereskovich called Vasily into his office and explained the true content of the orders the K-122 had received. The Kremlins and the entire sub's crew, worse fears, had been realized. It had happened. America had fired a nuclear missile directly at Moscow, reducing the Russian capital to an irradiated wasteland. The orders received by Captain Tereskovich were to retaliate, firing one of the K-122's nuclear payloads at the United States. Amidst the surrealness of it all, the details still bothered Vasily. Why was the submarine approaching Canada? The captain insisted that it was the best launch point, but the first officer felt it would make more sense to be approaching the coast of America. After the collision with the mountain that was not there, Tereskovich forbade Vasily from telling the rest of the crew that Russia was gone. 
and that there was nothing left of their homes anymore. But Vasily started to doubt the story. There were no signs of radiation outside the sub's own reactor. The currents of the ocean seemed unaffected, despite the supposed nuclear blast. Vasily and the rest of the crew were feeling increasingly on edge, and Tereskovich was refusing to listen to the first officer. Whatever had affected the two others seemed to be gradually taking hold of the other crew, more of them saying there was something wrong, that there was some force outside the submarine watching them. Then the subject of conversation turned to relieving Captain Tereskovich of his command. Despite Vasily's intention to restrain the captain and return the ship to the motherland, Tereskovich refused to let this happen without bloodshed. When one of the men, Orlov, explained the feelings and concerns shared by the rest of the crew, Tereskovich shot him on the spot. A mutiny erupted, with the captain executing five more of the men before turning the gun to Vasily, calling him a traitor. But before he could fire, the lights on the K-122 went out. Vasily ran away, finding Zima, another crewman who gave him a flashlight. It was then the first officer noticed it wasn't just dark, it was silent. The normal sounds of the sub that Vasily had grown so accustomed to were gone. The surviving crew were all scared, confused, and unable to repair the vital systems aboard the K-122. In fact, none of them seemed broken at all. The engines, the reactor, everything was in perfect working condition, without so much as a scratch. Yet the submarine was dead in the water. Vasily and the rest of the crew spent days hiding from Tereskovich, many contracting the same fever and perishing, while others struggled to survive on meager rations. Every time they tried to reach the bridge where they'd previously seen the homicidal captain, they found themselves in the wrong room, as if the layout of the K-122 was somehow being changed in order to redirect them. Then, after two days, as if by some force of miracle, the submarine systems seemed to reactivate on their own. But this was far from a return to normality. Confronting Tereskovich, Vasily and Zima learned the truth. An American destroyer was detected above the K-122 on a regular patrol route. The captain had lied to them. There had been no war, no nuclear attack. Despite being their enemies, the U.S. boat was the first sign of someone who could help the trapped men. But Tereskovich treated it as an act of treason against the Soviet Union. To make an example of him, he forced Zima into the torpedo tube for trying to contact the American ship and made the captive crew watch as he engaged the launch sequence. In that moment, when Tereskovich's back was turned, Vasily swung a wrench, killing the captain on the spot. After the K-122 resurfaced and the surviving crew aboard were rescued, Vasily took full responsibility for Captain Tereskovich's death. The KGB heard his retelling of events, both the anomalous occurrences were dismissed. Vasily Kestrov was facing charges of anti-Soviet activity and the murder of a decorated naval officer. But the KGB's own anomalous subdivision, GRU Division P, stepped in to have the first officer Kestrov quietly exonerated. The SCP Foundation have since obtained records from GRU Division P that have offered insight into what exactly happened aboard the submarine K-122. Photographs of the sub, official documentation detailing its deployment, as well as its maintenance and construction logs, all indicate there was no discernible difference between the K-122 and other submarines of the same model from the same time. However, for reasons that even the Foundation's top researchers can't discern, an unknown anomaly was somehow connected to the K-122. While its exact nature is unknown, the anomaly, along with the affected submarine, have been designated as SCP-7242. From what little can be gleaned from various eyewitness accounts, SCP-7242 resulted in a mimetic effect among human beings, which seemed to influence the minds of its crew, causing the incidents detailed in Vasily Kestrov's diary. Principal among them was causing the crew members to experience visual and auditory hallucinations, as well as having their memories altered in such a way that made the men aboard the K-122 highly susceptible to being manipulated. However, what SCP-7242 seemed unable to do was actually control the submarine itself. It had a limited effect over the various essential systems that kept the K-122 operational, and any and all machines aboard would function as normal. Some researchers have theorized that SCP-7242 was only triggered while the vessel was submerged, but without access to complete Division P records or the K-122 itself, 
the Foundation are left to speculate with no solid answers. The full extent of anomalous occurrences aboard the K-122 have been expunged from any available Soviet naval records thanks to the work of GRU Division P. Although official records from GRU-P indicate that the K-122 was decommissioned as a result of damage sustained on its maiden voyage, in actuality it was retrieved and taken to an undisclosed location for further research. The results of the GRU-P's findings have all been expunged, and the present location and eventual fate of the K-122 remains unknown to the Foundation. For all anyone knows, the cursed submarine could still be out there. Now go check out SCP-2956, We All Live in a Nuclear Submarine, and SCP-057-IT Under the Sea for more.